to four minutes before hour number one of Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown on Salem Radio Network's channel SR2. Four minutes from Mark. Four minutes. Now we're up on three and a half minutes until hour number one of the Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown on Salem Raider Network's channel SR2. Three and a half minutes from Mark. Three minutes, 30 seconds. And good afternoon, stations. We're now at three minutes before hour number one of The Light of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown, Salem Radio Network's channel SR2. Three minutes from Mark. Three minutes. And stations, we're at two and a half minutes before the start of hour number one of the Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. That's two and a half minutes from Mark. Two and a half minutes. And stations, we are now approaching two and one half minutes before the start of hour number one. The Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. Two minutes from Mark. Two minutes. And stations coming up on 90 seconds until the launch of hour number one of the Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown, Salem Radio Network's channel SR2, 90 seconds from Mark, 90 seconds. stations it's now one minute before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with dr michael brown one minute from mark one minute And stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of the line of fire with Dr. Michael Brown. 30 seconds until hour number one from Mark. That was our final verbal time check for the line of fire with Dr. Michael Brown. We'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before, followed by a short one at five seconds. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Let's put to rest once and for all this myth about today's Jews being descendants of the Khazar kingdom. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome, welcome to... Today's broadcast, Thoroughly Jewish Thursday on the Line of Fire. Boy, I 
I love being on the air with you. So glad that you could tune in. Everyone listening, viewing live, and those catching us later by podcast or on YouTube, welcome to the broadcast. If you have a Jewish-related question, here's the number to call, 866-34-TRUTH, 866-348-7884. But in particular, I want to give preference to calls from those who identify as Hebrew Israelites or Black Hebrew Israelites. I spoke last week about how Deuteronomy 2868 alone debunks the Black Hebrew Israelite argument. It is the most frequently cited text to support the Black Hebrew Israelite idea that the original Israelites were Africans, and it is the text that absolutely refutes that. I welcome calls. Now, a colleague in another state contacted me today and said, hey, I know some congregations in my city, and they tend to be friendly and respectful. Could they call in and have dialogue? If, if you didn't just make it like a call in, you gave them time to dialogue. I said, sure. They said, well, they couldn't do it today, but hopefully a future Thursday. So uh, we gave notice last week. And let me say this. I know that the broadcast was watched and listened to. I know it because of the flood of hate-filled, ugly, racist responses we got posted. Look, I hate white racism. I hate black racism. I hate white supremacy, black supremacy, Jewish supremacy. I hate it. I despise it. I renounce it. I denounce it. They're all ugly. I don't care what side it comes from. Yeah, there's been more than enough white supremacy, white racism in history and to this moment. And sadly, there's been more than enough black racism and black supremacy. Depends on where you've lived, where you've grown up, what your environment is. And as followers of Jesus and servants of the one true God, we renounce it. And we recognize that God is ultimately not looking at skin color, but on the heart and on the conduct and on the life. So yes, you get certain posts and you'll get white racists posting the ugliest, foulest, most ridiculous, reprehensible stuff imaginable. And you get other posts and you get black racists posting the ugliest, most reprehensible stuff. In this case, we got hit by a ton of that. You said, well, I went to your YouTube channel. You said that you might disable comments if they got too ugly. They don't seem that bad. Well, that's because we got rid of the really ugly ones. That's because the people coming on there, you know, die, you this and you that, and just you foul, lying, Edomite, devil nonsense. We, we deleted a lot of those, all right? But if you're angry with me, if you differ with me, you can call and be upset. I'm not going to get angry with you. If you're upset, go ahead and call and post. Go ahead and post. If all you want to do is post or your work schedule doesn't allow you to, to call, Go ahead and post. But somehow, can I be perfectly candid? Those interacting with me at Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, some of you can call right now. It's not that all of you are, are working jobs and tied up and unable to call. So if I'm so wrong, if I'm so deceived, if I'm in such error, hey, let's have a friendly discussion. And as I have opportunity, and I am, we have not yet been contacted by respected leaders that would be recognized in different segments of the Black Hebrew Israelite movement, which is not monolithic. Of course, there are different groups, just like with any religious movement or ethnic movement, you have different groups and subgroups. But we have not been officially contacted through our website, and it's very easy to do so, by someone who'd like to have a public dialogue or debate with me. I would absolutely welcome it. Uh, let me just touch on a couple of things, though, that folks have said in reply to Deuteronomy 28.68, which says this. I want to read it to you, all right? And then I, I want to take you into the Hebrew for a moment. And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt. It doesn't just say to any house of bondage. Egypt is used almost five, 500 times in the Hebrew Scriptures. And plenty of times, it's got nothing to do with house of bondage whatsoever. So to make this metaphorical, as some try to do. Well, it just means house of bondage, that any house of bondage. In America, was a house of bondage. No, that's not what the text is saying. A journey that I promised you that you should never make again. In other words, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, that place, he didn't say you'll never be in bondage to another nation anywhere. He said, but it, it's not my will that you go back there. That's the place you've been delivered from, and you don't go back there. All right, a journey that I promised you'd never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. But there will be no buyer. And I said that the one group of people that for sure that doesn't apply to is Africans who were sold into slavery. First, they weren't brought in ships to Egypt 
and then sold from there to America. Okay, that's, that's not the journey. That didn't happen. All right. But let's look at this more fully. They did not sell themselves. They did not offer it themselves. That's the first thing. And the second thing, it says there'll be no buyer. Tragically, to the utter shame of many in American history, to the shame of, of whites that thought that they had the right to buy blacks, to the shame of American ancestors that did those things. There were plenty of buyers. There were plenty of buyers. So what are some of the responses that I've seen? Well, the Hebrew does not mean sell yourselves. What it means is that there were blacks selling other blacks. Now, we know that happened in Africa, right? And I have black Christian friends who believe the American slave trade was partially a judgment on the African slave trade. In other words, African tribal leaders and others kidnapping Africans from different tribes and then selling them to Europeans who then brought them over to America and to other countries. All right. Horrific sin of humans against humans, as we've done through history, tragically. Uh, no race, no group, no, no ethnic uh, minority or majority can say that they have been without sin against others. It's tragically human race. So some said, well, the Hebrew means that, that there were other blacks selling their neighbor blacks into slavery. Hebrew would express that differently. Hebrew would express that as you sold one another, each one his neighbor. That's how it would be expressed in Hebrew. Others have said, no, 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 take a look, take a look at Isaiah 52, where it's the same Hebrew word machar, and it means to be sold. This is a passive form, to be sold. It's a different verbal form. And Matt, if we can put up that graphic, that uh, first text graphic of the Hebrew, what I want to show you is this. The Hebrew form at the end of Deuteronomy 28, 68 says, vehit makar tem and you will sell yourselves, you will offer yourselves. In other words, you'll be so desperate, you'll say, somebody, somebody buy us as slaves. Somebody buy us as slaves. We don't have the, uh, the yeah, there we go. There's the, the graphic for you. So you said, I can't read Hebrew. Those of you who are watching, otherwise catch it later on our YouTube channel. If you look down at the, the last two lines, right in the middle, there's this long Hebrew, Vahit Makartem. That's from Deuteronomy 28, 68, all right? The same form, the same verbal form called the hitpail, which here is reflexive, all right? So, animit labesh, I wash myself. Doesn't mean I wash someone next to me or some, I am washed, I wash myself, okay? It is reflexive. So, animit mit maker, I sell myself. So, it uses other examples of this. And this exact verbal form called the hitpail, reflexive. It's found also in 2 Kings 17, 17, 1 Kings 21, 20, all right? And, and then also 21, 25, in each case with the Hebrew law, sotara, to do evil, that you sold yourselves to do evil. This is a rebuke. This is a rebuke from the Israel's prophets and prophetic writers to say to the people, you sold yourselves to do evil. All right, that's what it means to sell yourself. So if you could read Hebrew, you'd know that in Isaiah 52, you were, you were sold because of your iniquities. It's passive. That's the nifal, nimkartem. All right? This is different. Hit makartem. Again, simple Hebrew knowledge would tell you that. So that's, that's another thing that breaks down in this argument. And then, and then, also, none shall buy you. And people say, well, the Hebrew kana can also mean to redeem. Yes, yeah, in some cases it can mean to redeem. It can actually speak of creation. It can speak of acquiring. But whenever it's used with sell, it means buy. Buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, sell, buy, sell, buy. Doesn't, you don't, it's not sell, redeem, it's sell, buy. Okay? So if, if we go to, to the, the other graphic, uh, the other Hebrew graphic that we have for Kana, you will see that this is used in this context, whenever you have the word buy, okay? And, and here we have a, examples, all right? Elsewhere, buy, okay? Exodus 21, 2, Genesis 47, 22, 50, 13, 27, 24, Deuteronomy 28, 68, etc. All right, so whenever you have buy and sell, you know what it means. 
So you were selling yourselves into slaves. Somebody buy us. Somebody buy us. It would take us as slaves. This is how bad the curse would be if Israel totally disobeyed. Somebody buy us and nobody would buy. That's what it's, it's, it's really straightforward in the Hebrew. It's really, really straightforward in the Hebrew. It's as simple as it gets. And to build a big case on this, this being the verse that's constantly used. No, it's not the only verse used, but it's constantly used. Wow, you couldn't pick a worse verse just based on the clear, obvious meaning of the Hebrew. All right? Uh, let's go to the phones on Long Island. James, thanks for calling the line of fire. How are you doing, Dr. Brown? Thank I'm, you so I'm doing well. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I'm, no he, I'm no Hebrew scholar, so I will take you at your word. But um, what I was, what I was trying to, what, I'm, I'm, I believe in Jesus, just like you do. Good. And I believe, I, I believe that uh, 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 the focal point is always Jesus, as love, patience, and mercy. It's not so much where you come from, or whatever the case may be. Now the thing, the thing about the Hebrew 68, I mean, uh, uh, um, Deuteronomy 28, 68. Yeah. I was trying to point out with, with, with uh, when I wrote to you on um, Twitter, was that. I don't see any other time when the verse, I mean, when the word kana is used or maka, which is to sell. Mm -hmm. Whenever it is used, it is always, it is, it is the same exact word that is uh, 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 used for redeem. So now if you use it in a context, how can you take it as, because for me, yeah. I, I, I understand it to mean that if you sell yourself, is that you move away from what God ordained you not to do. Now, because in, in uh, I believe in, um, um, I mean, but tell you what, James, we, we got a break. Stay right there. And I know exactly who you are. I, I don't often interact uh, individually on Twitter, but you were very respectful and gracious, and I spotted your tweet. Okay, thank you for calling. We'll get to continue on the other side of the break. Stay right there, sir. I want to present to you a unique way that you can partner together with me to reach Jewish people with the good news of Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Hey, Paul wrote that the gospel is to the Jew first, but many of us don't know how to reach the Jewish people with the gospel. Can I tell you, we have a unique open door and Jewish people are ready to hear, but we need your help. When I was in Israel recently, my last hour in Jerusalem, about a dozen different people came up to me and they wanted to thank me for the impact of our message. One Jewish woman came up to me, a believer in Jesus. She said, you saved my son's life. He was falling away. He was getting pulled by other objections to Jesus. He read your material. He's back in the faith. A young man came up to me. He said he and his Orthodox Jewish friends, here he is, I mean, with the, with the yarmulke, the head covering, the traditional Jewish outfit, he said, he and his Jewish friends, his Orthodox friends, watch my debates with rabbis. A few years ago, I was able to lead a Holocaust survivor to faith in Jesus. He was a brilliant man, an atheist who had fled the Holocaust. He read my books on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, came to faith, led his wife to the Lord before they left this world. Friends, we have the resources. We have books ready to be translated in Hebrew to be distributed in Israel. We have our Real Messiah website, unique for reaching Jewish people, Orthodox Jews with the gospel, ready to be translated in Hebrew, ready to do internet campaigns to get into every home in Israel. Every cell phone in Israel can have this message, but we need your help. Every gift to our ministry will literally help us reach another Jewish person with the good news of Jesus the Messiah. Go to Ask drbrown.org askdrbrown.org and when you go there we will partner together to bring salvation to Israel and the Jewish people together we're making a great difference now is the time to reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel to share the line of fire with your host Dr. Michael Brown your voice of moral cultural and spiritual revolution here again is Dr. Michael Brown Welcome, friends, to our Thoroughly Jewish Thursday broadcast. I want to get back on the phone with James. But, Joseph, on YouTube, have you not heard me say that many, many times that there are Africans that have Israelite-slash-Jewish blood? The Ethiopian Jews, for example, 
There are some others potentially that do as well. Are the majority of Africans related to the ancient people of Israel? No, absolutely, certainly not. It can be demonstrated on many, many different fronts. Are some Africans related to ancient Israel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we've said that many a time. All right. I want to go back to James. So Deuteronomy 28, 68, uh, you were explaining how you understand the verse. Go ahead. Okay. Now, let me. Uh, is it possible for you to read it for me, please? Because I don't have my Bible with me. Surely. Uh, I suppose okay. you want me to read it in English, yes? Yes, sir. Oh, I do not know Hebrew. <laughs> That's all right. Here we go. The Lord will send you back to Egypt in ships by a route which I told you you should not see again. There you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but none will buy. Okay. Now, in the Bible, there are figurative language and there's little language. And I feel like that verse use some figurative language because to me the 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 prophecy of that verse is a conditional prophecy agreed if you do if you do what i tell you to do this prophecy will not come to pass correct but if you don't do what i tell you to do this prophecy will come to pass now if like like i said i don't really get caught up into who's israel who's not israel because mm -hmm. i believe god knows who these people are and i just i'm glad that you just mentioned because that was going to be my next question because i think a couple weeks ago you had a on your show, you had a rabbi that was an historian, and he said he was breaking down different group of people that was related to, to, to Jacob or to the 12th tribe of Israel. So to me, that debate is not something that we need to take on, because I started listening to you based on how you present Jesus, Jesus and that's how I still listen to you, because I'm a big fan of, of, of what you do. But it was just that question, because I have a lot of friends that are Hebrew Israelites, yeah. and then they always trying to push Jesus to the side, and I always trying to show them, like, Jesus is in the and, Old and, Testament. And, and listen, like, yeah, James, night. here's bottom line. I, I'm, I'm a Jew, but Caucasian through Ashkenazi heritage, okay? If my Savior okay. was a black man, I would love him just the same. If your Savior was a, was a white man, you would love him just the same. If he had a different color skin, if he looked like an Indian from India or Chinese from China, we would love him just the same. So it's all about Jesus. And you're a hundred percent right that no one even says that Deuteronomy twenty eight sixty eight ever came to pass. In other words, did Israel disobey that fully and that persistently that all of the curses of Deuteronomy twenty eight came to pass? Some would say yes, others no, but you're a hundred percent right in terms of the way you're reading it. But the reason I wouldn't take this figuratively, yeah. sir, is that the whole chapter, as, as, you, as you read it through, as you read the chapter through, you, you see that it's one literal thing after another literal thing. It, it is exile. It is destruction of crops. It is physical diseases. It is breaking down of families. It, it is dispersion and fear, all literal things. And the other thing is, if if we want to understand what buy and sell mean in the same verse, it's really simple. So your word association, I say up, I said, give me the word to come up, down, left, right, north, south, east, west, male, female, right? Buy, sell, uh, same thing, not, or sell, buy, not sell, redeem. But James, let's, let's agree on this. It's all about Jesus. And what God wants is that we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, love our neighbors, ourselves, and make Jesus known. And any group, I don't care what their skin color is, I don't care who they are, that pushes Jesus off to the side. Look, I know, I know plenty of white Christians who get excited about Jewish roots of the faith and get so caught up on now thinking that they're spiritual Jews or now trying to find some connection to one of the 12 lost tribes and Jesus gets pushed over to the side. So lots of groups do it. Lots of groups from all color and all background do it. I just happen to be addressing one error. I've addressed the other error of, of people getting caught up with Jewish roots and pushing Jesus over the side. I've addressed that 10 times more, 100 times more than I have issues with Hebrew Israelites. Hey, James, we were getting some feedback on your phone. I don't know if you had another call, but God bless you, man. Thank you for calling from Long Island. Maybe one day we'll meet when we're out in the New York area. But thank you, sir, for the call. 866 Three, four, truth. Okay, remember, any Jewish-related question of any kind you have, by all means, give a call. We know that in the book of Esther, at the end of Esther, it tells us 
that people from all over the world converted to Judaism, became Jews as a result of God's victory for the Jewish people against Haman and his fellow oppressors as the Jewish people fought back. So just that would tell you you've got a wide range of people who ultimately have become part of the larger Jewish community. Because remember, someone saying I'm Jewish, it's an ethnic thing. It's, it's a DNA thing. It's a biological thing. It's a historical thing. So you can be a Jewish atheist. You can be a Jewish Buddhist. You can be a traditional Jew. There are many different things you could be as a Jew ethnically. And then there is Judaism, the religion practiced by Jewish people. If someone converts to Judaism, they are considered Jewish. So as you've had different groups interacting, uh, so, some try to trace the origin of the Lemba tribe, all right, in Africa, and Lemba's in, in Zimbabwe, and if in fact they do have Israelite DNA, and some say it goes back to when Jews were living in the Saudi Arabia area and then interacted more with Africans that were in the north at that time. And then those Africans became part of the Jewish people, converted to Judaism, and then intermarried, etc. cetera. And, and then ultimately, according to their legend, they, they came to the south in Africa, or according to their actual story, whether it's legend or not, I don't, I don't know. But in, in any case, we understand when Israel came out of Egypt, there was a mixed multitude with them. We understand that. So Israel has been multi-ethnic from day one, but there is a preponderance, a root preponderance of those who are ethnic descendants. So you want to hear something really interesting. People, I've had black Hebrew Israelites say to me, yeah, but look at the, the Lemba tribe, another example. Now, there are some geneticists that dispute that and claim that there's more of an Islamic Middle Eastern connection than an Israelite Jewish connection. But how did they prove? How did geneticists prove or believe that they had discovered that there was an ancient Israelite connection with the Lemba. They identified a Y chromosome that Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews have who are Kohanim, who are priests, who are descendants of Aaron. Ashkenazi Jews that the black Hebrew Israelites say, you're not real Jews, you're Edomite devils, you're white Edomite devils. They found the similar chromosome in Ashkenazi Kohanim, Ashkenazim who descended from Aaron. And Sephardic Jews, even though they're separated geographically, they still had that common Y chromosome going back to Aaron from what we can tell. That same chromosome was found in the Lemus. So they're related to the Ashkenazi Jews then. Yeah. <sighs> In uh, a little bit later in the broadcast, we will we will discuss the Khazar myth. We've talked about it before, but we'll we'll put it to bed once again here. Hopefully, dead and buried. Although people are always going to believe conspiratorial myths and things like that. Eight six six three four truth. Uh, let's go to the phones in Utah. Nate, welcome to the line of fire. Hello. Hello. Um. My question is about uh, Genesis twenty two fourteen. Yes, um, sir. My roommate got a, a Hebrew Old Testament, and he's starting to learn a little bit of Hebrew and stuff. And he was wondering about why why all the other places that the word where it says the Lord will provide the word for provide everywhere else in the Old Testament seems to say or uh, yeah it's an interesting yeah so so those those who've sung the song Jehovah Jireh my provider so in, in Hebrew it's it's Yahweh your eh and that literally means the Lord will see the Lord will see which is understood to mean the Lord will see to it it's idiomatic Nate it's not the normal usage your friend is absolutely right it's not the normal usage. Now, if, if you look at different translations to Genesis twenty two fourteen, there tends to be the same understanding, okay? Uh, but in fact, it is idiomatic. Um, so the King James just transliterates it, Jehovah Jireh. New King James, the Lord will provide. CSB, Lord, I'm looking at translation after translation that say the Lord will provide. Uh, the complete Jewish Bible explains it, Adonai, the Lord will see to it, all right? And uh, Tanakh, New Jewish Publication Society, just says, Abraham named that site Adonai Yir Eh, 
once the present saying on the mountain of the Lord, there is vision. So number one, the word for vision or being seen ties in with ra'ah. So the Lord will see, namely see to it. In other words, he'll see the need and it's just understood will provide. And then later the Lord will be seen there. That's how it ties in with Hebrew. But 100%, this is idiomatic. It is an understanding of the Hebrew. It's been reflected through tradition through the centuries. But if you read it in English, you say, what's see got to do with, provide got to do with see? Again, the Hebrew is literally, the Lord will see. Hence, it is said, on this mountain, the Lord will be seen. A play on words there. And an idiom for provide, he will see, namely see to it and meet the need. Great question from you and your friend, Nate. Thank you so much. We'll be back with more of your questions with some fascinating news about this new Jewish Sanhedrin. Honestly, friends, I don't know what to make of this. Some fascinating news, your calls, and debunking the Khazar hypothesis. Hey friends, I want to take a moment to thank you for standing with us and, and show you firsthand where your funds have gone, the renovations, the upgrades to our studio, and what we've been able to accomplish with your help. Hey, come around here. I want you to see something. I don't think we've ever shown this before. So this is how things operate. All this brand new, just in recent months, recent weeks, right there, big screen as I can see what's happening that we need to be seeing. Over here are different clocks for radio for different segments in time. Over here, this is, if we're putting things on live stream, you're gonna see what I'm seeing right here. Over here, this is where I'm in contact with the rest of the radio studios. Calls come in, I interact over there. And right over there, you can see where there's a second camera. That will be used when we have guests in studio so that we can get everyone on camera. Right now, we haven't been able to do that, but we're gonna be able to do that. This is also going to enable us to have different angles as we do Skype videos and Skype debates. But, but let me show you some of the most exciting stuff. Hey, come this way. All right, I want you to meet Caleb. Caleb is our video, audio, computer tech expert. He's new here. He's only part-time. We need him here full-time. We are now able to do our daily live stream of our radio show, so you're watching it on video. You're hearing an audio clip on the radio. You're watching a video on YouTube. Something happens in the news, boom, they're on. We've got high-tech equipment. Pull it up, put it on the screen. I can talk about it, read it to you as you're watching at home. It, it's, it's amazing. And we now have new equipment that's going to enable me on the road to do high-quality live stream of my radio show in America, even in other countries. And, and oh, we've got a big gap here. We need a major new computer. Not only will it enable us to get things out even more quickly, so something happens in the news, you're frustrated out. What does Dr. Brown have to say? No problem. We got it covered within minutes. It's up, it's out. But we need this for post-production as well. We need one more person sitting here. If you can believe it, the thousand plus videos that we have out, plus we record in there from the Ask Me Anything broadcast for God TV and the NRB TV Line of Fire broadcast recorded right in there in our studio. We do all of that with me and one and a half employees. We need to add Caleb full time. We need one more person in here. We need that computer. With that, friends, the sky is the limit for what we can put out. We are your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Help us amplify your voice. Together we're making a difference. A generation is being impacted. So your one-time gift goes a long way, really, in helping us advance this Jesus revolutionary cause. And we'll be back with more updates as they happen. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the Line of Fire. Hey, 
Behind the scenes, for years now, there has been a faithful employee at Truth Radio that gets our broadcast all around the country, Dear Johnny, and he is moving on after years of distinguished service, so we blessed him privately. We want to bless him publicly on this next phase of life. All right, Johnny, get hear the applause for everybody out there? There you go. All right, welcome to Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. This is Michael Brown. Here's the number to call if you've got a Jewish-related question, 866-34-TRUTH. Okay, before I go to the phones, really interesting news from Israel. I've been hearing more and more reports about a gathering of rabbis, a new Sanhedrin. So you need 71 rabbis for an official Sanhedrin. There has not been one for centuries What's stopping it from happening? Is it just up to the Jewish leadership to do it? Well, some leaders among the thousands of rabbis in Israel have come together to be the new Sanhedrin. Now, I've got some Christian friends very excited about that and say they've got a great heart to work together with Christians. And then I have my concerns saying, well, if they're Orthodox rabbis, they look at someone like me as, as an enemy, Messianic Jew, wanting to get other Jews to believe in Jesus. Well, something's going to be happening September 3rd. And this is now being proclaimed, and articles being written about this on Breaking Israel News and other places, that, that says Sanhedrin is inviting Christians to inaugurate the universal Rosh Hashanah, okay? So this is something that's going to happen on September 3rd, uh, the 23rd of the Hebrew month Elul. And, and the, the newly proclaimed Sanhedrin says, we are not... We are not asking Gentiles to join together with us for prayer and singing as, as non-Jews during the Jewish holiday. We're proclaiming this as a new holiday. Quote, we're not calling on the non-Jews to observe a Jewish holiday, Rabbi Hillel Weiss explained to Break the Israel News. We are creating an entirely new and unique holiday that is relevant to everyone on the planet. There are global threats that bind us all together, ecological and political. It is precisely for these situations that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob established a house of prayer for all nations in Jerusalem. This concert is a way to bring all the nations together to praise God. Rabbi Weiss said, this is an event organized by Orthodox Jews, but it does not belong to any one religion. We are acting in our prophesied role as a kingdom of priests serving the nation in order to enable them to serve Hashem, the Lord. Okay. What do we make of this? I don't know. It's really, really interesting. Really interesting. I don't know what to make of it. Is this yet another sign that the third temple will be rebuilt and the coming of the Lord is very near? It could be. Is this unity of Jews and Christians something positive where Jewish people are recognizing genuine evangelical love and support for Israel? Is it another step, as some would say, towards an antichrist, false peace? Hey, I don't know, but it's interesting. It's interesting to be the ones that are watching this unfold. All right, before I go to the phones, let me debunk once again, but even more systematically, the idea that those who say there are Jews today, in particular Ashkenazi Jews, who'd have more of a European, Eastern European descent, as opposed to Middle Eastern Jews like the Yemenite Jews or Sephardic Jews from Northern Africa and Spain. Those that identify as Ashkenazi Jews, that would be me, that would be the Jews that were slaughtered in the Holocaust. My wife, Nancy, like 99% Ashkenazi. I think I was 90% Ashkenazi, 10% Sephardic. So the myth is that Oh, about 11, 1,200 years ago, the Hazara kingdom converted in mass to Judaism. And those who claim to be Jews today are actually just descendants of the Khazars with no connection to Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the people of Israel, no real biological, historic, genetic connection. That is a complete myth. I don't care how many people talk about it, write about it. It is a complete myth. There's a really helpful article that was posted on the forward, forward forward.com, September 25th, 2017, by Alexander Bider. Ashkenazi Jews are not Khazars. Here's the proof. 
And it systematically demolishes through excellent scholarship, summarizing what many other scholars have said, it absolutely demolishes this notion. Number one, there was not a large Jewish presence in the Khazar kingdom, which we know archaeologically people leave traces behind. There is some evidence or at least good speculation that some of the leadership of the Khazar kingdom converted to Judaism. But there was not a widespread Jewish presence there, number one. Number two, there was not widespread conversion that is documented. Number three, the Khazars were subsequently wiped out. Okay, you're talking over a thousand years ago. So that demolishes it on that level. In terms of historical trails and travels, it does not support the Khazar thesis. As far as Ashkenazi Jews, we do not trace back in our geographical history to that region of the world in Asia where it was. We do not trace back to that region. That is, we go from the Middle East and then ultimately through Europe. So there was not an Ashkenazi presence. So historically in our travels, it does not work. The history of the Khazar kingdom and what happened to them subsequently does not work. Archaeologically, there is not evidence to support this. Linguistically, the patterns of the Yiddish language that became the traditional language of the Jewish people in Europe do not have any mixing with this, which would be more of a Turkish, Middle Eastern, Asian mix. And I'm being very broad here in the way I'm presenting it. It does not work linguistically. And genetically, it does not work. And Ashkenazis, from what we can tell, go back to the Middle East, go back to the people of Israel, and then in Europe at a certain point in time with numbers fairly low, there was then more intermarriage, more conversion into Judaism from the surrounding peoples, and then multiplication of children. And then again, Ashkenazi Jews who identify as Kohanim, so someone with the last name Cohen, most likely they are descendants of Aaron, and this can be confirmed chromosomally, genetically. So this Chazar thing is just another myth. And, and normally the ones that push it are Jew haters and often Jew wannabes, sad to say. But let's put that myth to bed once and for all. Oh, but someone wrote, people write every, you know, it's uh, nowadays you should realize everybody makes every kind of crazy claim. Just because someone wrote about it, the fact that it's been debunked and destroyed, so that get rid of it. You write anything, you could post anything, you could say anything, but these things have been demolished from every different angle. 866 34 Truth. All right, we go to the phones uh, starting in Kentucky. Tom, welcome to the line of fire. Hey, Dr. Brown. Been greatly blessed by your ministry. Just want to let you know that you mean a lot to me and my family. Um, um, today's question. Um, you know, I've watched a lot of your videos, and those are enormously helpful on YouTube and things. Um, I've had quite a few, um, just some very close friends who have started, um, you know, following some different things, uh, I guess, from Torah. Mm -hmm. And um, they are um, not Jewish. Um, they are believers in Christ. They are definitely saved. They, you know, there's fruit of salvation, all those kinds of things. Um, but kind of taking the road of Torah is a gift to us, and because it is a gift to us, we're going to do things like follow the dietary laws, keep Sabbath, celebrate feasts, things along those lines, and the kind of the, the behind that would be is similar to when in the Old Testament when someone would come into the Jewish community, right. that they would follow those things, such as circumcision, such as following those different things. So, right. um, you know, I, I'm my heart is open to if something's pleasing to the Lord, there's going to be a blessing to my family, such as celebrating the feast with my children. You know, I, I'm all for it, but, um, you know, I just, my, I'm not settled and I'm doing my best to be open to everything the Lord has. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at. Um, well, just, you're Tom you're, first, you're, first. Yeah. Thanks for the kind words. Your heart's in the right place. You're open but you're not settled about this, and you shouldn't be, because these people are inevitably on a path of error that will ultimately degrade the importance of Jesus, Yeshua, in their lives and get them caught up 
with increasing Torah observance, which then they will believe is mandatory, which then they will believe is mandatory for everybody, and that you're in disobedience if you don't practice it. Now, I hope, I hope it doesn't go that way, but that's the way it normally goes. Mm -hmm. Now, it's wonderful to celebrate the biblical calendar, but why not? Wonderful, great. And mm -hmm. if you say, well, look, God never changed the Sabbath, and even though the seventh-day Sabbath was assigned for Israel, you know, I just want to join together in that which has been historic. For, great, there's no, no one stopping you. And if you say, well, there must have been a reason God gave the dietary laws, I think I'm going to keep it. You're totally free to. But when it becomes a matter of, well, we should go back to Torah because observing Torah is what you did. If you, you joined Israel, there was one law for the, for the sojourner and for the people of Israel. It's a mistake. Now, in 1984, the Lord spoke to me. The whole, quote, Jewish temptation, in other words, this thing of trying, wanting to be Jewish and feeling like you got to identify more as Jewish as opposed to finding your identity primarily in Jesus, right? So, mm, uh, look, yeah. my spirituality is not found, I'm a male, right, to the core of my being, but my spirituality is not found in being a male follower of Jesus, but by being a follower of Jesus. Yes, I'm a son of God, not a daughter of God, but my identity mm. is not found in being an American or a Jew or a male, but being in him. So the word the Lord gave me is the whole, quote, Jewish temptation is in the soul realm. It will fascinate, stimulate, complicate, suffocate. So be on your guard. Fascinate, okay. um, is stimulate. Is it okay if I follow up with a question, Dr. Brown? Yeah, yeah, sure. But let me just finish this. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, so it will fascinate, stimulate, complicate, suffocate. So what happens is get all excited. Man, I never knew this before. This is so interesting. And man, I'm just so hungry for the word. I want to learn more. But well, that, well, but what about the new moon? I want to we keep them. Well, the purity laws. I mean, I want, and boy, my family Christmas, I probably shouldn't go there anymore. And then suffocate before you see it. The prayer lives are down. Very little evangelism. Just to say Jesus is Lord or I love you, Jesus, Yeshua, I worship you. People have a hard time doing that. And Paul said, these things are a shadow. The substance, the substance is found in the Messiah. And you're not under these things as a new covenant believer, especially Gentile. We'll be right back. Stay there. You know, we've heard for years now, love is love. Love wins. And I have the right to marry the one I love. And, and maybe you know a gay couple, maybe family members or friends, and they really seem to love each other. Maybe they're raising kids. They love their kids. They're devoted to each other just like a heterosexual couple. You say, surely, love should just accept that and embrace that. And, and many, even, even professing gay Christians, would point to Romans chapter 13, verse 10. Romans chapter 13, verse 10, and that tells us that love does no harm to its neighbor. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. So if I know that telling my neighbor that homosexual practice is sin is going to hurt them, aren't I harming them? If God is love, won't he affirm a loving relationship? All right, let me make this clear. The reason that Scripture opposes homosexual practice and homosexual relations is because God is love. And because God is love, he wants what is best for us. And he didn't make a man to be with a man or a woman to be with a woman. They may be loving, they may be kind, they may be devoted to each other, but God did not make men for men or women for women. God has something better. The first thing is for people to truly know him as Savior and find forgiveness of sins, whatever those sins might be. The second is to find wholeness and completeness in him. I know folks who used to be practicing homosexuals who are now happily married heterosexuals. I know others that used to be practicing homosexuals that are now celibate. They haven't seen a change in their desires, but they love the Lord and they've crucified the flesh and they're fulfilled as single believers. This much I know. If I affirm homosexual practice, if I tell that couple, God bless you, I want to affirm you as a follower of Jesus, I am not helping them, I'm hurting them. The relationship is wrong in God's sight. The relationship is not the best that God has for them. And ultimately, if they come to understand that God is against it, now they're living in...
It's the line of fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the line of fire, 866-348-7884. The Early Jewish Thursday, welcome to the broadcast. By the way, earlier in the show, we revisited some of the issues having to do with the Black Hebrew Israelite misuse of Deuteronomy 2868. You can catch that all on our YouTube channel, ASKDR Brown. Uh, all right, so back to you with your follow-up question, Tom in Kentucky. Go ahead, sir. I have a follow-up question, um, and thanks for the answer uh, uh, earlier. And um, so I, I heard the argument that all of the um, covenants in the Old Testament are and kind of leading into the new, obviously, are built on top of one another, and that the the new covenant is actually called the renewed covenant. And uh, just curious what your thoughts were on kind of that line of thinking and kind yeah, of it's, the it's, uh, it's renewed false. covenant. Yeah, it's, it's false. No, number one, uh, the Abrahamic covenant stands by itself. And Paul makes clear in Galatians 3.17 that the law, speaking of the Sinai covenant, cannot annul the earlier promises that God gave to Abraham. So the Sinai covenant was put in force for a purpose. Paul's explicit on this in Romans, in Romans 3 and Galatians 3 and 4. And it was to bring Israel under sin, to expose sin, to demonstrate the holiness of God, and to point to the need for a Savior. And then ultimately it declares both Jew and Gentile in need of a savior. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is Deuteron- uh, Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 explicitly contrasts the Sinai covenant with the new covenant. The third thing is the Hebrew word chadash for new is the way to say new. Now, it could in certain circumstances refer to something being renewed, but it would have to be quite explicit. If it just says something new, it's understood. It's new. That's the Hebrew word for new. So you say the new moon. Well, it's actually, it's the same moon. Yeah, yeah, but it appears new. I mean, it's not the renewed moon. The Israelites didn't think it's the renewed moon. No, it's it's a new moon each each month. So again, all this is a special pleading. Yeshua brings to the fullness. He fulfills the law and the prophets. So everything in the Hebrew scriptures ultimately points to him and finds fullness in him. And when the New Testament talks about keeping his commandments, it's talking about what he taught what Jesus himself taught and commanded us in the New Testament. So I'd be concerned about the direction your friends are taking. I've seen many go in this direction and end up in an unhealthy place. Not all, not all, but many. All right, thank you, sir, for the call. And and by the way, when I said about the Khazar kingdom, I said, said, Asia, if, if you want to be technical, I said I'm speaking very generally in broad linguistic terms, so southern Russia, Okay, but you've got things shifting over periods of time, the borders of Russia and other things like that, northern Asia, southern Russia. That's where the Khazars were, the Ashkenazis. That's not their history. Anyway, enough said on that. Uh, Let's go over to Cary, North Carolina. Eric, welcome to the Line of Fire. Thank you for your program. I'm using earbuds. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you, sure. I could ask you a hundred questions and talk to you all day, but uh, this one I'll ask you for today's theme. Uh, Several places in the New Testament, and I can't mention exactly where, the uh, event of the Passover is mentioned, and it's called a uh, celebration of the Jews or a festival of the Jews, and I don't understand why it's uh, written as a parenthetical comment when the, the... message seems to address the Jewish audience, but it it distinguishes them and explains that. Yeah, well, actually, and that's that's a wise question, and and thank you for your kind words as well, sir. But uh, it's a wise question to notice that, but the answer is in the question. It's telling you that it's understanding that they're going to be Gentile readers, that they're going to be readers who are not familiar with this, and therefore they need that clarifying information. So you're not going to find that kind of language, say, in Matthew's gospel, because his intended audience is Jewish. But you could find certain explanations in Luke, who's writing for a broader audience, or in Mark, uh, even, even in John, as, as he's explaining certain things. So if, if, I, if I made reference to Tiger Woods 
who is a famous golfer, you know that I'm, I'm not talking to your average American and certainly not to your average sports fan or, or golf fan. Or if I say Donald Trump, the president of the United States, uh, who is the president of the United States, I'm obviously talking to someone that's so far away that they, you know, they're unconnected. So yeah, that tells you when you see those parenthetical remarks, you know, for example, in Mark 7, where Mark tells you, about Jewish customs for cleansing, and they don't eat without washing and in the hands, etc. That uh, uh, you know that was a. It, it's telling you that he's not writing first and foremost for a Jewish audience. That's why he has to put that explanatory comment in. So that's your answer. The comment tells you that there's a wider audience being addressed. Okay. Well, you you uh, touched on my uh, response. It would be that it seems, and I'm not. Uh, a literary person, but it seems anachronistic that they would, add, it seems like a modern kind of literary device, and I can't figure out why it, it does, it just doesn't seem to fit in that history. Oh, no, no, it's it's common. It's, you find ancient literature and will have explanations and glosses, and maybe this is for a later generation of readers. You, you have certain things that explain, for example, in, in the Torah, where, where it says the Canaanites were then in the land in Genesis 12. Well, Whereas if that was known at that time that the Canaanites were there, but when it's being written, obviously that's a gloss. So when Moses is writing about this, he's not writing it because the Canaanites were there. But someone later, an editor, wanted to explain, by the way, the Canaanites were in the land there, puts it in parentheses. So you, you'll see that throughout the Bible. You see it in other ancient literature. It's common. So it's not just a modern thing. It's common to explain something that the the readers that you're trying to get to will not know about. Very common. But thank you, sir. Appreciate the question. Um, yeah, let's see. Uh, Curtis on YouTube, Talmudic Jews are the enemies of Jesus. Even, even Muslims see Jesus as at least a prophet. Talmudic Jews hate the Savior. Uh, sir, some do. Some do. You're right. Some traditional Jews hate the Jesus they've heard about, but they don't know who the real Jesus is. They hate the Jesus who's associated with the Holocaust in their mind because many of the Nazis were professing Christians. And Austria, Hitler's home country, was equally divided between Catholics and Protestants. That's the Jesus they hate. They hate the Jesus of later Jewish tradition that claimed he was an illegitimate child, a bastard, that he was a deceiver who did miracles by pagan power and led Israel to follow other gods. So the Jesus of later Jewish tradition and reaction against church hostility, a lot of that is penned. They hate him. There are plenty of other rabbinic Jews. I know them personally. that say, we don't really know much about Jesus. Those Talmudic references, we're not sure who they were talking about. You know, is there a Talmudic reference that says Jesus is burning an excrement in hell? Or is that talking about someone else? There is debate among rabbinic scholars about that. It's an ongoing debate about it. And uh, there are some that believe, I spoke to them in Israel in May. I mean, they believe that's Jesus. Yeshu, they call him, which in their minds also stands for Yimak Shemov may his name and, and memory be obliterated. Good news is his words will stand forever. Good news is one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. But uh, there are others, friends of mine, rabbinic Jews say, we really don't know much about Jesus. We don't really know who he was. And, and then there are others who say, we believe he was a great rabbi and teacher, rabbinic Jews. We believe he was a great rabbi and teacher, and the church then made him into a god. The church then said he died for our sins, but he was really a great rabbi and teacher. That's what my friend Rabbi Shmuley Boteach believes. He wrote about it in his book, Kosher Jesus. I wrote a response called The Real Kosher Jesus. But yeah, there are, absolutely. There are some, there are many very traditional Jews that despise the name of Jesus, will not say his name. If they say it, they'll spit on the ground. An Orthodox rabbi, ultra-Orthodox rabbi, once told me that if his father said the word Christianity, he would literally throw up. That's how repulsive this is. But rather, rather than get mad at them, have a broken heart for them as, as Paul did for his own people in Romans 9, and then realize that a lot of what they hold to is a reaction to persecution of Jews in Jesus' name excluding of Jews in Jesus' name, demonizing of Jews in Jesus' name, claiming that they were guilty of deicide, that they were Christ killers and therefore God killers, 
So some of the ugly Jewish tradition is an ugly response to ugly Christian acts. But bottom line, Jews remain responsible. Everybody's responsible. And Paul said that when he was persecuting fellow Jews who believed in Jesus, notice what it says that he acted ignorantly in an unbelief. And then Peter gets up and preaches in Acts 3 to those who turned the Messiah over to Romans to be crucified and said, you, you acted ignorantly, now repent. So my prayer is that those that are acting in ignorance will be confronted with the truth and then be responsible to respond to that truth. But rather than just throw stones, and trust me, I'm in the midst of Jewish debate and dialogue day and night and reject it and hate it for it and respect it in other circles for it. But I'm, I'm not downplaying the fact that, that my people historically have rejected the Messiah in large numbers and nationally. I'm not denying that, downplaying it. And traditional Jews, very traditional Jews in Israel see me as, a, as an absolute enemy. Absolutely. I'm not just a chote, a sinner, but a machti, one who leads others into sin in their view. Absolutely. That being said, pray that God would open their hearts and minds. Many are tremendously zealous for God, as Paul says in Romans 10.1, but just without the full knowledge of God. Pray in the midst of their zeal and prayer that God would reveal His Son, the Messiah. All right, back with you tomorrow. You've got questions, we've got answers. 